urban or sub suburban area to improve pest management is in, in these examples. These are study sites that were used by folks at University of Maryland in the 2000s. And in this box, you've got a sort of older neighborhood with overstory trees and understory trees, azaleas tucked back in here, and azaleas along here. Um, compared to these azaleas that are in front of, I don't know what it is, a dentist office or a bank or, or something like that, out in the blazing sun. And what, what Shrewsbury and Raup found was that in these more complex habitats that had more plant species and more layers of vegetation, lace bugs were much less abundant than they were out in this simple habitat. Similar work has been done with other critters. This is pine needle scale, same thing, where in urban trees, simple habitats compared to complicated, complex natural habitats, pine needle scale becomes um, more abundant in those simple habitats. And they attributed this also to, partly at least, to a lack of, of predators and parasitoids. But other things happen as you change from natural areas to urban areas. And one of the big ones is that temperature increases. And you know, folks have known this for hundreds of years, that it's hotter in the city than it is in the countryside, which is why folks used to have country houses that they'd go to in the summer. And the reason that temperature increases is primarily because the amount of impervious surface increases. And so impervious surfaces include um, roads and blacktop, sidewalks, rooftops, buildings, all of these surfaces that absorb radiation from the sun and release that into the environment as heat. And so this creates what we call the urban heat island effect. Um, and if you've ever, of course, walked across the parking lot at a swimming pool barefoot or something like that, you realize that there's, that the pavement is far hotter than um, the grass is. And so what we've been working on in, in my lab is the hypothesis that it's actually heat, so this urban heat island effect that increases scale abundance on urban plants. And so I'll show you some of that today just to give you an idea of how heat and stress and other factors affect scale insects and how you may be able to mitigate those uh, when, you're, when you're working on a client's property or, or installing new plants. So a little outline here. We'll look at how uh, urban warming affects pest abundance and fitness. We'll talk about how that affects tree health because, of course, if it didn't affect tree health or condition, we really wouldn't be interested in it. And then we'll talk about some of the integrated pest management tactics that are available to help manage scale infestations and to prevent scale infestations. Okay, so I start my story with this, this guy from days gone by. His name is Zeno Metcalf, and he was actually our department head here at Maryland. Uh, in 1912. And the reason that I mention him is that he was the last person pretty much in the world to work on this critter called gloomy scale. And so especially if you're in uh, the mid-Atlantic or southern U.S., you've certainly encountered gloomy scale on red maple trees and other species of trees. And in 1912, Dr. Metcalf called gloomy scale the most important pest of shade trees um, in North Carolina and in the southeast. And of course, as things go, since then nobody else has worked on it. So when I got here and, and started working on gloomy scale and Googled gloomy scale to see what, was, uh, what I could learn about it, the only thing that came up were psychological studies that described um, psychiatrists trying to come up with ways to rate people's sadness. And so um, that was kind of a trip, but 
Now, if you Google gloomy scale, lots of other good stuff comes up. So we started from this point where we've got a super common pest that no one has worked on in a um, in hundred years. And the way that this critter works is it overwinters as a mated female and lays eggs in spring or early summer. And so right now these things are, the females are feeding, they're gearing up to start producing crawlers. And the crawlers for this scale come out from, uh, well, at least in North Carolina, from mid-May through July. And that's part of the trick in managing this scale is that the crawlers come out for eight or ten weeks instead of in one synchronized batch. And so with insects like Euonymus scale, all the crawlers come out at one time. You can hit them with horticultural oil. You could practically hose them off because they're all there at the same time. With gloomy scale, you've got this slow trickle of crawlers throughout the summer. So these are relatively easy to identify for little tiny creatures. Um, they've, they're grayish, brownish, black, very convex, um, and tend to have this white ring, which is uh, their, their previous molted skin. Hosts, most common are red maples and virtually any red maple in uh, the, the southeast and up into the mid-Atlantic that has any red maple planted in urban area probably has gloomy scale, all the ones that I've seen. But gloomy scale will also get on other hosts including some hickory, I've seen it on dogwoods and poplars and tulip poplars um, and other things here and there but its primary host is red maple. And so the damage that gloomy scale causes, and scales in general, is that since they're in there feeding on plant fluids and pulling out the nutrients and energy that plants need, you tend to get dieback starting at the tips. And so in this picture, you can see the tips of these branches are dying. Um, as the scales build up and then you know overall the tree just let, starts to look shabby. It's got a poor shape, it's got a sparse canopy that you can see right through to that building behind it and eventually trees can die because they become so heavily encrusted with scales. And here's a, a picture of how dense these scales can become on um, on red maple twigs. So how does warming affect red maples and gloomy scales? The way that we approach this, and this is interesting just for any uh, anyone working with with plant pests to understand, this is a thermal image, a satellite image of the surface temperature of Raleigh. And what you can see, ignore these white parts uh, that's just a, a zoning, a different zoning thing. So ignore that, but focus on these red and green and yellow patches. And these represent the surface temperature. So the temperature at the surface of the earth. Um, and the brightest red here at the Raleigh airport is about 10 degrees hotter than this dark blue, which is actually State Park right next to the airport. And so you can see that throughout Raleigh and the surrounding suburbs, you have a mosaic of temperature where even downtown, you've got dark red patches and some lighter blue patches. And what this looks like at a smaller scale, and the reason that we did this is we use city tree maps and all the green dots on this map are willow oak trees and we get these maps from the city of Raleigh. We put them on top of the surface temperature map and then we can go in and look at trees in hot red areas that might be just a couple blocks away from tree areas and that allows us to compare temperature of trees um, while keeping other, other variables fairly constant. 
So we picked, we've done this on hundreds of trees probably by now. And we go in, of course, we count scale abundance, we measure natural enemies, we take the temperature of the tree. Um, and then we also measure habitat variables like, like the complexity that I measured, how much vegetation and how many vegetation layers are there. And importantly, we measure impervious surface. And this is also done with satellite images. You can see this tree that we had in this industrial park. Um, and we can measure the amount of impervious surface around that tree. So the punchline here, after years of work, is that scale abundance increases about 200 fold as temperature increases about two and a half degrees. And so this is the average yearly temperature. And as we go from the average yearly temperature of just over 18 degrees C to uh, 20 or 20 and a half degrees, you get two to 300 times more scale insects. And what that means is that trees look like this one with nice clean bark and no scale insects, or at the other end, they look like this one where it's crusted and black and gray, which is where the scale gets its name. The trees get these sort of gloomy, spooky appearance. Um, just over the course of a couple of degrees difference in temperature. So the interesting part about this is why the scales become more abundant. And what my student Adam figured out is that over the same temperature, in this picture you see these are gloomy scale embryos and they produce three times more eggs as they get warmer. And so part of the reason you get so many more scales at hotter temperatures is because they're producing three times as many offspring. So the other scale insect that we've done a lot of work with is the Oaklacanium scale. And this is widespread throughout uh, the East Coast and mid Midwest. Um, and probably farther than that. And what you see, the most common symptom, you'll see these big brown warts on willow oak trees and, and other oak trees. And those are the egg cases of the scale. This is my student Emily who did most of this work. And the Oaklocanium scale also is one generation per year, like the gloomy scale. And but a little bit different life cycle. And right now, in spring, it's starting to swell up into these egg cases. And this, the, the stages are this brownish red egg covers. Those are those big hemispherical creatures. The crawlers actually um, are cream colored and then move out to the leaves to feed for the summer. And they're almost transparent. You can hardly see those. Um, and then the adults come back to the branches in the fall. Here's the general life cycle. Here we are now in spring with these mated adult females. They swell up to produce egg cases over the next couple of weeks. Flip those over and you've got two or three thousand eggs inside of there that hatch and all those crawlers move out to the leaves to feed for the summer. Before leaf, drop, before leaf drop, they move back to the twigs where they spend the winter um, as nymphs or adults. And these are, by the way, soft scales. The um, gloomy scales were armored scales. And later on, we'll talk about some of the differences in those two groups of scales. But the hosts of Oaklocanium scale are primarily oak, as the name implies. We see the most on willow oak around here. They're also frequent on pin oaks and, and white oaks and red oaks and all kinds of oaks. And of course, we find them on related tree species like hickory, sycamore, uh, birch, chestnut. We see these a lot on the new elms that are being planted out, uh, just covered in lacanium scales. There's a related species that really people 
call a different species. They're not quite sure how to distinguish it, and that's the European fruit lecanium. It looks the same. It behaves the same. It's got the same life cycle, and it infests a lot of other tree species, dozens and dozens, such as dogwoods, um, birch, redbud. I found it on um, service berry and winter berry and, and, and all kinds of different tree species. And so it's, it's uh, technically a different species on those hosts, but the management and the, and, and the life cycle are all the same. So it's really immaterial. Again, scale insect damage comes from the insects feeding on the fluids in that plant, reducing their reserves of the plant's reserves of carbohydrates and, and uh, other nutrients and energy. And so you get similar consequences of canopy thinning, leaf drop, uh, branch dieback starting with thin twigs. You can see here's a thin twig with no leaves on this little tree. Um, where gradually the tree is pulling back um, as, as the scales are just overwhelming those, those thin twigs. And since this is a soft scale, it produces a lot of honeydew. And honeydew comes from the, scale, the soft scales feed on plant phloem, which of course is the sugary solution that is produced in the leaves by photosynthesis, and it moves down to be stored in the roots. And these insects feed on honeydew, which has lots of sugar, but not, or I'm sorry, they feed on phloem, which has lots of sugar, but not much in the way of nutrition. And so they have to drink a lot of it in order to get enough nutrients to grow. And so they release all the excess out of their rear as this sticky honeydew. Um, Oftentimes with the Oclocanium scale, the first thing that people notice and the reason that they call for help is their cars or their patios or their sidewalks are getting covered in this sticky secretion. Um, and then once, once an arborist gets out there, they realize that it's, that it's uh, a soft scale involved. So, my student Emily did similar line of research. Long story short, when she compared her trees in cold spots or cooler spots, again, this is about a two degree difference to trees in hot areas of the city. Um, she had about uh, eight to 12 times more scales on her hot trees than her cool trees. So we, we've spent a lot of time recently looking at how scale insects affect tree health. Um, and, you know, as an example, here's, here's the way a red maple, that we would like a red maple to look with a nice shape, dense canopy, lots of active growth um, on, all those, on all those twigs. And then here's the same sad red maple that we've seen before with lots of dead twigs and, and, and a transparent thin canopy. And so arborists and, and urban foresters have a system of rating trees from on a scale of poor, fair, good, or excellent. And we use this rating system. Luckily, all the trees in the Raleigh database and other cities that we've worked with have ratings attached to them. So for every tree, we know the temperature, the relative temperature of that tree, and we know the rating of that tree. And so what we're able to do then is um, compare trees in the hottest areas with the most impervious surface to trees in the coolest areas using a whole city database. And what happens is, in these hot, impervious areas, you get mostly poor and fair trees, the two worst categories, and less than 25% of trees in the good and excellent categories. And in the cooler areas, you get mostly good trees with some 
excellent trees and some fair and some poor trees mixed in, but very few poor trees. And so over the whole city, there's a clear pattern that these red maples in the hottest areas are in the worst condition. So to summarize some of this, urban warming increases scale insect abundance um, and just two degrees of, of warming increases scale insect fecundity and survival and, and population growth on these trees. Here's a really nice infested gloomy scale twig. Here's what they look like underneath. So we started working with um, understanding, of course, why cities are hotter. And cities are hotter because of impervious surfaces and lack of tree cover. And impervious surfaces are bad because they make things hotter, but they also do a lot of other bad stuff for trees. Um, largely, they reduce water infiltration because they're impervious. Water can't get through there which reduces soil moisture. That can increase drought stress on the trees. They also increase soil compaction and the soil underneath impervious surfaces is generally bad to begin with and so um, taking the air and water and, and, and root space out of it with impervious surface certainly doesn't make it better. And so all these factors associated with impervious surface probably contribute to the results that we see um, with our temperature data. And so what we wanted to know is if we know that impervious surface is bad for trees, which it is, um, can we use this to try and, and improve integrated pest management and improve how and where we plant trees to try and and prevent pest problems before we start. So of course putting the right plant in the right place is um, sort of a foundation of, of uh, arboriculture and, and pest management. And so how much impervious surface is too much? What this comes down to, our real question then is is there an impervious surface threshold? In integrated pest management, we often work with pest thresholds. And so, you know, with pest thresholds, we, we try and figure out at what level of pest infestation management is required um, to prevent economic damage or aesthetic damage. In this case, we want to know how much impervious surface can we allow before trees are susceptible to scale insect infestations. And so ideally we can even prevent the pests rather than having to create a pest threshold. Maybe we can prevent them altogether. And so here's some of the situations, of course, you all have seen in your experience. You've got a red maple and a nice uh, lawn like this, a, a, a wide tree strip here parking lot island and then here's the worst you know this is the worst parking lot island it's about 18 inches on each side from the trunk um, and so which one of these induces scale insect infestation to spare you the analysis and all the figures the essence is this um, if you have 0 to 32 percent impervious surface at about 25 yards around a tree, the most likely condition of trees, and again, this is using trees from the entire Raleigh tree database, so about 8,000 trees. Um, the most likely condition of those trees is excellent or good. If you have 33 to 66 percent impervious surface at 25 yards around a red maple tree, the most likely condition of that tree is good or fair. And over that, 
almost the only condition we found trees at uh, was poor. And so above 66, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a tree in poor condition. So if you have low impervious surface, plant your red maple in there. If you have a medium amount, if you put a red maple in, try to um, give it extra love. Maybe come back and water it more often. Uh, take a little better care of it, especially during establishment. And above that, then just please don't plant a red maple. So how do we measure impervious surface? This is the trick now that we've got this threshold. Well, we can do this from satellite images. And if we put 25 yards around this tree and use ArcGIS, we can calculate that this is 66% impervious surface within that circle. However, this is good for landscape architects, urban planners, and folks like that who use AutoCAD and, and ArcGIS when designing landscapes. And so we're reaching out to those folks so that uh, they understand this threshold and trying to convince them to not spec red maples in areas where there's so much impervious surface because they've got the software and they're drawing the plans. Um, but what if you don't have the software? This gentleman's trying to pick a, a tree to put in um, at his national park headquarters here. Is there a way to measure impervious surface without um, fancy and expensive and uh, hard to learn computer software? Turns out that there is. And what we've, what we've come up with for this is what we're calling the pace to plant technique. And you'll be able to read about this in the, uh, our Boer Culture and Urban Forestry. Next month, we've got a paper coming out, uh, if you get that magazine, um, that describes this in greater detail. But the way that it works is, you stand at your tree site where you want to plant a tree. You could also use this to assess, you know, um, you know, existing tree. You know, bef after you know, uh, when you're called out to assess the the health of a tree um, that's been there for a while, you could still assess the impervious surface around that tree and kind of make predictions about how well it will do in the future. But the essence is. You stand where you want to dig your hole. You turn 45 degrees to the closest impervious surface, which is generally a curb. Um, and then you take 25 steps along that transect. And all you have to do is count the number of times your foot lands on impervious surface. You repeat this three more times which of course if you take 25 steps four times you've taken a hundred steps you've hopefully kept track of all the times your foot landed on impervious surface if you can't keep track of this which actually is, is a little bit harder it's a counting app where you can just every time you poke your phone it will count for you um, that'll help you keep track of it but regardless with a hundred steps the number of steps out of that your foot lands on impervious surface essentially gives you a percent of impervious surface. We've got a cartoon here to help demonstrate this. Here's our tree planting site. Here's our closest impervious edge. And so if you turn 45 degrees to that edge and take 25 steps, in this cartoon the white steps you can tell have landed on impervious surface, either this curb or the road or the sidewalk. You repeat this, turning 90 degrees from that original transect each time, and you add up the number of steps. And the great part about this, I'm sure you will be amazed, 
66 steps. And remember, the, the calculation from our ArcGIS software was 66% for this same site. So this is pretty, uh, it's simple and it's, it's, it's pretty accurate. Don't put a red maple in there when you've got 66% impervious surface. Of course, all the trees you see in this figure are red maples, and they're all doing very terribly. Um, and we've done this, uh, we've experimented with this technique using my shortest graduate student, my tallest graduate student, Adam, who, who helped develop this. We've tried it in all different sorts of impervious surface scenarios. Here's a narrow sort of devil strip, and here's a T intersection, and um, the corner of this four-way intersection. Some crazy intersection I've never seen, but we came up with, and it works there also. And so it's pretty universal in how well it, it predicts impervious surface cover, or measures it. Um, and so again, draw your 45 degree line, take your steps, you want to be careful not to step on people's cars. Um, don't climb up the sides of buildings. If you run into a building, just assume everything beyond there is impervious. And of course, watch for cars if you're crossing a street. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. And so this is how you can quickly on-site measure impervious surface to before a tree is planted or for an existing tree uh, to help inform your decision of, of whether that tree has, has good future prospects or not. It could be that a client has a tree that's very infested with gloomy scale. They want to know whether um, to try and save it or not. If that tree is surrounded by a high percentage of impervious surface, it probably is not going to do very well, no matter what um, what you do to try and save it. And so they may be better off uh, with something different. OK, so here's our threshold. 0 to 32 is good. Be careful in this medium 33 to 66% range. And don't plant red maples in this high impervious surface range. So what about existing infestations? I'm sure a lot of um, your work is on, of course, existing trees that, that may have been there for 100 years and now have pest infestations. The first thing to do when you're called out to assess the scale infestation is to determine what, what group of scale insects you have. There's 7,000 species of scale insects. Um, in presentations like this, I, I usually find it sort of uh, meaningless to try and describe all these different scale insects and have people try and, and remember what they look like because that's what books are for. But the important thing for you to be able to assess quickly um, to, to, to start making a decision is whether you have one of the two most common scale insect families. And these are armored scales, like the gloomy scale, or soft scales, like um, the lacanium scale or wax scales and some of these other things. The reason that this is important is because the management of these two scales differs. And so, um, particularly with regard to imidacloprid, which is, a, of course, a very commonly used product in landscape and tree pest management. And imidacloprid is not effective for armored scales, um, but is effective for soft scales. So there's two ways to distinguish between these scales in the field. Armored scales, you can see in this picture that um, the scale insect, if you, take, if you take the tip of a pocket knife or a paper clip or something and flip that cover off, here's the cover that used to be covering that scale insect, the body of the scale stays on the plant. And so 
the cover and the insect are separate. If you do that with a soft scale, like a lacanium scale or a wax scale, and you fl try and flip the cover off, when you look at the branch, there will be nothing there because the, the body of the insect is permanently attached to that wax cover. And so if you take the cover off, you take the insect off. The other way to distinguish these is that armored scales feed in parenchyma cells and do not produce honeydew. Soft scales feed in phloem and produce lots of honeydew. And so if you can see scale insects on a plant and you also see sticky honeydew and the black sooty mold that grows on honeydew, then you know you have at least some soft scales. It doesn't mean, of course, that you don't also have some armored scales on the same plant, but um, you know, you'll be able to determine that, that a large percentage of those critters are probably soft scales. So those are the two ways to um, distinguish these in the field. Of course, you can always send scale insects uh, or other pests to um, your local land-grant university if they have a pest clinic. I'm not sure if Rainbow has its own um, corporate clinic or not, but getting an, a, a real identification on these is always helpful. Lots of other armored scale insects. Here's the Bible of scale insects that you can that you can find. It's got a couple hundred species in there that are that are common. Um, and again, this is why it's trying to learn every single one is not uh, probably a good way to spend the hour. Lots of other important soft scale insects also and so you'll be able to distinguish these two. Now in terms of management, convent, uh, traditionally scale insects uh, over the last decades have been managed largely with contact insecticides, organophosphates, um, and pyrethroids largely. And of course some of these acephate has some advantage in that um, it does have systemic activity, but it also leaves a very toxic residual if you spray this as a foliar application, of course. Um, it leaves toxic residue on the leaves that kills natural enemies. Carbaryl, we don't recommend for scale insect control it's contact only. It's got a short residual. Pyrethroids also are contact only, so you'd have to make foliar applications of these, a short residual, um, and they kill natural enemies that land on that plant subsequently. And lots of work has been done showing that using contact insecticides increases scale insect infestations because you've got an insect that lives underneath a waterproof wax cover. And so you can spray that with pyrethroids all day long. The insect will be fine, but all the predators and parasitoids that land on that plant um, will die. And so that's where you get uh, scale outbreaks after using these products. And one thing to think about is that it's become more and more common to have these mosquito control services and it's worth asking your clients if they use a mosquito service. Um, these are the services that come in every two to three weeks and spray the whole landscape with a backpack fogger of bifenthrin or permethrin to kill mosquitoes because if you're trying to manage scale insects using some reasonable IPM techniques and the, the next day somebody's coming in and spraying the whole landscape with pyrethroids, uh, you have to build that into your decision-making process because that um, is likely to increase scale insect outbreaks and mites and other things. 
Okay, um, horticultural oil can be great for soft and armored scales, particularly when crawlers are emerging. And so for that oak lucanium scale, all the crawlers come out uh, pretty synchronously. And if you hit those trees with horticultural oil, as the crawlers are coming out, you can make a big dent in them. We've, we've managed to whittle away at oak lucanium infestations, even spraying them in uh, throughout the summer and winter. There's some other uh, newer oils out here. One of them is this emulsified oil. It's called Suff Oil X from Bioworks. You open the jar and it looks like mayonnaise. It's this creamy white substance. The nice part about this is that it stays in solution since it's pre-emulsified. Um, you don't need as, as constant or vigorous agitation to keep it in solution. And of course these don't leave toxic residue on plants, but, but um, you probably need, your, th these are going to help you maintain scale insect abundance, um, but you're not going to kill every scale with one application of anything, these included. And then the, the products that, that folks use primarily now are um, neonicotinoids. So for armored scales here, you've got dinotefuran, acetamiprid, thiamethoxam that all kill armored scales. And of course these are using um, traditional either foliar or drench applications. If you're using an injection system or something like that, I know that Orthene and, and other products are available for injection. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure you've got technical folks at Rainbow who can help you make those decisions. But these are what um, are typically applied. And again, imidacloprid is not effective for armored scales. And so you just need to make that distinction. The other thing that's been great for armored scales is these insect growth regulators. Distance and talus, which uh, go on as foliar applications, um, tend to be really effective on armored scales and soft scales. And so if folks are concerned about the neonicotinoids, which increasingly your clients may ask if you're using neonicotinoids, um, these insect growth regulators are, are good alternatives. So that's all I've got. I just wanted to point you to our website if you want to look through, find out more information about the research we're doing or our extension program. We've got all kinds of extension publications up there, including this, uh, a couple of free iBooks on, on tree care that you can find covering all manner of uh, the most, the ten most common tree species here. We've got a Twitter account that we use just to send updates on pest activity. For example, yesterday I saw rose sawflies out in my yard and I could immediately just take a picture and send those out to all the, all the folks who subscribe so that they can go look at their roses and see if um, the pests are active there. So if you're interested in that, if you use Twitter and want pest updates, you can follow me that way. And that's my last slide, so I'll turn it back over to Peter for questions or whatever's next. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Frank. Uh, that was a very informative presentation. Uh, now we'd like to move on to the Q&A portion uh, of this webinar. Uh, I'll be reading the questions from the audience, and Dr. Frank and Aaron Dickinson, who's here with me, uh, are available uh, to answer your questions. Uh, if you do have any questions or, or uh, during this conversation or this portion, please continue to uh, type those into the questions box, and uh, we'll make sure to answer them with the time that we've got here. So I'm going to open up the questions box here, and it looks like we do have a question. Uh, we are seeing increasing amounts of Japanese maple scale in the Cincinnati area on a wide range of plants. I was wondering if you had any insights into this pest. Uh, many different hosts, maples, pears, crab apples, euonymus, etc. 
Yeah, so um, Japanese maple scale does seem to be uh, increasingly common. Nurseries are seeing more and more of it, and I'm seeing more and more in the landscape also. Um, and whose screen are we on now, Peter? Because mine just changed. Oh, we Anyways. are on my screen. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, we're seeing more and more of this in the landscape. It does infest at least 200 kinds of plants, probably. Um, and what what folks have found at Maryland and other places where they've been working on this in the nursery is that the insect growth regulators, like uh, pyroproxen and bupropozin seem to provide the best control, um, but the neonics, like uh, Safari in particular, tends to, to provide pretty good control also. The trick with this pest is that it has multiple generations per year, and so three to four, or in the south, probably up to five generations a year, and it, it comes out asynchronously and so at any given time you can look at a tree and find adults which of course this is an armored scale so they're sealed in tight underneath those scale covers you can find nymphs and you can find crawlers all at the same time and so anytime you make an application to a population like that you know you're having a, a big effect on the crawlers that are exposed and you're having less effect on the adults that are larger and protected by their their cover and so there doesn't seem to be um, well of course there's no silver bullet but it it does with this and other armored scales often take multiple applications over the course of a year or two years to bring that to a satisfactory level the other trick with these Japanese maple scales is folks find them typically on the interior of plants and so when you've got these big hollies and boxwoods and things that are pruned very uh, pruned very heavily and have this real dense exterior foliage that people like but then the interior is sort of sparse it's hard to get your application um, into those scales that are deep inside of that that plant on the trunk um, and it's also hard to detect them there and so often oftentimes people don't see them until they're really really abundant okay thank you our next question here is uh, if you use asphate as a soil drench or soil injected uh, does that help with preserving beneficials yeah so um, the, the primary threat to beneficial insects is when you have a toxic residue on the leaves. And so an injection or drench um, of any of the systemic products is going, um, an aspate in particular, is not going to leave that residue on the leaves that a foliar application would. And so it'll be in, in the plant, and so insects that feed on the plant will uh, be exposed to that chemical, but parasitoid wasps and ladybugs and things that just land on the plant and walk on the plant won't be. So that's a good way to uh, take advantage of that product, which can be effective on a lot of scales, but reduce the risk to um, the beneficials. Okay. Uh, the next question we have here is, uh, what is the best chemical management for euonymus scale uh, or cultural oil in late May and in June? Uh, will this help with controlling mite outbreaks? So on euonymus scale, it also has several generations per year. Uh, down here it has three, about three generations a year, um, which also makes it uh, a little bit harder just because you've got crawlers coming out all the time. The first, you know, the best time to try and hit those is the first generation of the year because they tend to be synchronized. And so 
in a given landscape, all the crawlers will come out approximately at the same time. And so that's when a horticultural oil application would make the most difference is when the plants are you know, literally covered with all these crawlers and you can knock them out all at once. The other things we've found um, for that we've tested on you on the scale are the insect growth regulators that work very well and pretty much all of the the three neonics I mentioned um, dinotefuran, acetamiprid, and uh, thiamethoxam all kill you on a scale pretty pretty well. It doesn't seem to be as tolerant of insecticides as as some of the others like gloomy scale. It seems um, you really need multiple applications. The Euonymus scale seems to succumb a little easier. In terms of mite outbreaks, you sh uh, none of those applications should probably induce mite outbreaks. Where you get the, the most risk of mite outbreaks is if you're using a pyrethroid. And so pyrethroids like uh, Tau Star, which is bifenthrin, and permethrin have been linked to mite outbreaks in agriculture and urban landscapes and in every system in which they're used just because um, they don't kill mites and so the same thing is that they kill all the predator predators and things and uh, but the mites the mites do just fine and so anytime you're using a pyrethroid the risk of mite outbreaks is there. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Frank. And we, we have a we have a couple of questions that were uh, submitted uh, prior uh, to the webinar. Um, we'll go ahead and read some of those and answer those right now as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Are you there? I think the audio is not working, Peter. Uh, are you able to hear us okay now? Yes, now I can hear you. So, um, referring back to now I can't. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up here. Uh, just wanted to do a quick plug on uh, saluting branches. Uh, this is a very important project that we're working on. Uh, saluting branches is an annual event that we started last year. Uh, on September 21st of this year, uh, we'll be bringing together tree care and landscape professionals from across the country to provide a day of service at local veteran cemeteries. Uh, last year, we had over a thousand volunteers and donated over a million dollars worth of tree care, uh, pruning, removals, plantings, and plant health care. Uh, if you are interested uh, in signing up this year, uh, please go to salutingbranches.org uh, for more information. And finally, uh, one final note here, uh, we do have uh, more webinars uh, coming up, uh, some great topics and great presenters. Uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, you can go to treecarescience.com uh, to register for these uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, and finally, um, it would be much appreciated if you could fill out the quick survey uh, that follows immediately after this webinar. Again, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Frank uh, for your time and your presentation today. Uh, and we thank everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, hope you have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.